welcome to everybody and thank you for inviting me to give a, a very brief overview on Dr. Reinhardt's career. I, I knew him briefly at the towards the end of his career and the beginning of mine, um, but I did lean on other people in our division to put some of the information together that I'll just mention and that's in the handout. So um, as a very basic CV to, to see how his training went, he was raised in St. Louis, went to high school here, college and medical school at Washington University, spent a year at New York Hospital, which is now the Cornell University Hospital, and then returned here for his residency, the last year of which was he was the chief resident, and this is a picture from the Department of Medicine at, while he was chief resident in 1942 and 43. What's not shown in a, in a basic CV like this is that um, he, he was proud of the fact that for four years, beginning in 1933, he cut the grass in Tower Grove Park using a hand lawnmower, just a real mower, uh, every day for four summers. And think about it, it was in the, in the midst of the Depression. And his best year, he made $125 for the whole summer of cutting grass. But people were just lucky to have jobs at that time. So it was really quite, quite striking. Um, he, he was an excellent clinical investigator and scholar. He worked with Carl Moore and others in revision. And uh, one of his more important contributions was to study the role of P32, both in leukemia and polycythemia vera, where it did have a role for a number of years. But he also uh, worked in other fields as well, working on ITP and iron metabolism. And then he even had a few publications on sickle cell disease, and I've shown one here from 1943, looking at the effect of high oxygen concentration. This was before the molecular uh, or, or genetic mutation of sickle cell was even known. And, uh, but sickle cell was known and it was thought to be an obstructive disease in the vessels and they thought higher oxygen levels would help. And in fact, it did not help, but they published several, several papers looking at the physiology of oxygenation in sickle cell patients. He was also a very skilled teacher. He was involved in teaching medical students, house officers, and fellows over several generations. And I sense that this would be one of the things he was most proud of. And in fact, he did CPCs that, that we still know today. He did them at a first time every other week. And so you can imagine these were not just hematology cases. This was mm. all of medicine and he put together uh, long discussions and had an uncanny knack for getting the right diagnosis most of the time. He was also a consummate clinician. He was uh, considered by many people to be a humane and caring physician. Um, he was described as having the ability to empathize with his patients who were suffering from their illness. And he, he was also described by several of my colleagues as, as being very kind to the house staff and fellows as well. Um, and, and he was also very meticulous and precise in his records. People talked about him spending uh, uh, being very careful in measuring lymph node sizes and spleen measurements and things like that from a clinical perspective. And lastly, in, in the 1970s, he presented uh, a, a, a presentation to uh, the AOA lecture in 1974. There was a crisis in medicine at the physicians were felt to be not caring, doing more testing and not being as, as uh, empathic to their patients. And so he wrote this in the summary of, the, of an article that he wrote on the on medicine and the crisis of confidence, um, which was required reading for medical students for, for a number of years after that here at Washington University. And what it said was, in short, if you study for the rest of your life, do not flaunt your superior status in life, show humility, and in addition, finally achieve the kind of understanding and compassion that we've been talking about. There was, will be no lack of confidence. Indeed, your patients will know that they were being taken care of, not only by a competent medical scientist, but also by a great physician. And so on that note, I want to welcome Dr. Gladwin and thank you for uh, spending a minute remembering Dr. Ron. Thank you, Dr. Blinder, for, uh, for that uh, lesson. Uh, so a speaker whose accomplishments honor Dr. Reinhardt uh, need not only be a commensurate physician scientist, but also an excellent clinician, educator, and leader. Um, hence, we are honored to uh, welcome Dr. Mark Gladwin uh, to, from the University of Maryland. Uh, born in Palo Alto and raised in the United States, as well as in Ghana, Mexico, and Guatemala, 
uh, Dr. Gladwin uh, obtained his bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of Miami six years uh, honors program in medical education. He then completed his internship and chief residency uh, from uh, the Oregon Health Sciences University, followed by a critical care medicine fellowship at the NIH uh, and a pulmonary fellowship at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Gladwin's career has included serving in the roles of phys a physician scientist, a clinician, an educator, as well as an academic leader at now three institutions, starting with the NIH, then the University of Pittsburgh, and now the University of Maryland. At the NIH, he conducted many seminal studies and rose to the chief of the pulmonary and vascular branch at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. In 2008, Dr. Gladwin was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh to serve as the chief of the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine and the inaugural director of the Vascular Medicine Institute. Um, it was in this role that I met Dr. Gladwin um, nearly 14 years ago. And his enthusiasm for science, uh, his commitment to clinical excellence and promoting the career development of fellows and faculty uh, has something that has left a lasting impression on me. Um, I still remember rounding with him in the ICU as a resident back then, when he would ask every resident uh, who was on service if they were going to go into pulmonary and critical care. <laughs> Despite them having told him multiple times they were either doing cardiology or hematology, but that actually convinced many people to do cardiology, critical care, or many other sort of ancillary, uh, their ancillary training in either pulmonary or, or critical care medicine. Uh, but his leadership resulted in the division uh, at the University of Pittsburgh really becoming one of the most sought after training programs in the country, um, paralleling UCSF, Denver, Penn, as well as Washington University, among many other institutions. And fellows from all over the country really came to develop their academic careers there. Uh, Dr. Gladwin assumed the role of department chair in 2014 overseeing more than 800 faculty, um, including 120 PhD faculty. Uh, during his tenure, uh, the department at Pittsburgh, the NIH funding there increased by more than 25% and resulted in the department being ranked as one of the top 10 funded uh, departments of medicine at, in NIH funding. When he left Pittsburgh for Maryland, there were, the department had 54 career development awards. At the core of his inspirational leadership is a remarkable research career. Um, some of the work which he will present to you today. Uh, Dr. Gladwin has published uh, nearly 500 manuscripts, which have had a significant impact on the fields of vascular and nitric oxide biology. Among his major scientific discoveries is the fact that the nitrite salt is a biological signaling molecule that regulates hypoxic responses. Um, his seminal publication on the, on the role of hemoglobin and myoglobin as signaling nitrite reductases that regulate nitric oxide production under hypoxia is listed by Nature Medicine in its top 10 classic collection. This work led to the development and licensing of IV, oral, and inhaled nitrite as a human therapeutic. In addition to the studies of nitrite, uh, he's characterized a novel mechanism of disease, hemolysis of associated endothelial dysfunction. So his studies on this topic have led to a clinical and epidemiological description of a human disease syndrome the hemolysis associated pulmonary hypertension. And more recently, his lab has pioneered the use of recombinant neuroglobin and heme based molecules as antidotes for carbon monoxide poisoning. Dr. Gladwin has several honors, including being a member of the AOA, the American Society of Clinical Investigation, and the Association of, Academic, uh, of American Physicians. He's received numerous academic awards, including the US Public Health Service Achievement Award as well as multiple awards from the NIH, including the NIH Director's Award for Mentoring. Hence, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Gladwin to the John T. Medicin Department of Medicine to present the Edward Leinhardt Lecture on Translating Redox Biology to Medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Grish. That's a lovely introduction, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, I wanna thank Carrie Whitson, I don't know if she's in the room, but she's been showing me around for two days. So I really appreciate uh, her doing that. Of course, Dr. Lee, Dr. and Lee and I were both fellows at Seattle um, and worked together for a long time at Pittsburgh. And uh, she is just a spectacular, enthusiastic leader. And I think you're in great hands with her joining you. And of course, uh, Dr. Frazier, who she and I have worked together at the APM Council for years and reviewed departments. And um, I've always just been so impressed by your wisdom and uh, confidence and experience um, and humility as a leader. So you've been a role model to me. But 
I, can't, I, I spoke at Hematology Grand Round virtually a year ago, um, but I was here about 10 years ago pre-COVID and I'm sort of stunned by the growth of this institution. But it's really an honor and a privilege to be here because this is one of the great academic medical centers on clinical excellence, educational excellence, physician scientist and science excellence. Um, and we're always in awe when we come here as physician scientists because the caliber of science and translation here is astounding. Um, I would just say to, to all of us as we emerge from this pandemic that it was an incredible reminder of why academic medical centers are so important. That uh, if you think about it, we are temples of enlightenment, of diversity, of teamwork, um, and of leadership through science. And the pandemic taught us that we were in this new world, really we represented the public health delivery of the country. We weren't just ivory towers anymore. We reached out with testing, with education, with science knowledge, with clinical trials, and with care delivery. And I now, as we have the electronic healthcare direct, uh, uh, ability to reach out and touch people with preventive medicine, I think we're gravitating more towards uh, delivers of public health and have the ability to address uh, inequity. But uh, all of you in as leaders and future leaders in academic uh, medical centers are going to be charged with addressing great generational challenges ahead of us, like pandemics. Remembering that SARS-CoV-2 was only one of 10 near pandemics that hit us only in the last uh, 10 years and more will come. And we now have the pandemic of mental health, the challenge of the brain and neuroscience and how to tackle mental health. We have the, the pandemic of obesity and metabolic syndrome. We have the pandemic of gun violence. We have the pandemic of addiction in all its forms, which is rising exponentially in this country. And all of these challenges are really gonna be met um, by academic medical centers and by you in the future. And I think Dr. Reinhardt was interesting to read his bio because he was a chief resident in 1942. That was World War II. Can you imagine the world he lived at the, at the beginning, pre-antibiotic pre era? Penicillin had just been introduced and then dealing with the devastation of people returning from World War II, the mental health challenges that we didn't even understand um, and the physical disability. And then later in his life, he marched from Selma to Montgomery. So he was a champion of the social equity, uh, social justice movement, which again is one of our great generational challenges. So it's real honor to, to, to reflect on his life and what he faced. And when we think how tough it is, what we came through in the last four years, imagine uh, his post-chief resident experience. So let me start here, see if I can get this to work. All right, so hopefully you all can see this. So I'm gonna share a translational story of discovery. I'm very excited to share two new, th new things in our lab. Um, and I'll try as I go through to share some of the lessons that I learned early in my career that may be of value uh, to the young people in the audience. I will talk about some conflicts. I will talk briefly about patents related to nitrite patents related to the development of antidotes for carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and I just show you my conflicts and funding. Um, so my career is focused, I was a late bloomer in science, actually, I didn't pipette until I started my research fellowship at the NIH after doing critical care, a pulmonary at Seattle and a year of multidisciplinary critical care. And I started doing cell and molecular biology for about two years. And then I started dabbling in a little side project with inhaled nitric oxide in patients with sickle cell. And that really ultimately led or catalyzed a career spent studying the interactions of hemoglobin and then ligands beyond oxygen, nitric oxide, nitrite, which is a dissolved salt and carbon monoxide. This is the nitric oxide molecule. It's a diatomic a uh, gas molecule, but it has a free unpaired electron, so it's very reactive, which I'll come to, but it, it's freely diffusible, it's colorless, odorless. It's not the fun molecule, nitrous oxide. It's the, it's the, the, the uh, uh, colorless, odorless signaling molecule, NO. And we now know, and the Nobel Prize was awarded 
for the discovery that in blood shown here, shear stress activates a, a very complex enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. And through a five electron oxidation and oxygen dependent oxidation of arginine to citrulline, it generates this nitric oxide radical, which diffuses to smooth muscle. It binds with high affinity to a heme group on an enzyme called soluble guanylate cyclase to activate it. And the cyclase converts GTP to cyclic GMP, which causes relaxation of the vessels to improve blood flow. Now, not only shear stress, but under basal conditions, as you'll see, you're making nitric oxide. 25% of your resting blood flow is determined by NO being made all the time. So think about it. This is really a paracrine signaling molecule. It's going from one cell to the other. And this is the hemoglobin molecule. Now, you can kind of see the heme groups coming into view here with the central iron. So this little flying saucers right here, there's one heme that's inserted by a histidine bond in each of the monomers of the tetrameric hemoglobin. Now, this is the most studied molecule. If you include the molecule, the diseases associated with abnormalities in the molecule, the promoter system, enhancers, silencers of the uh, transcription of the messenger RNA of this molecule. You know, this molecule, of course, um, uh, you all know about the Haldane Bohr effects. You know, it, it binds oxygen, it binds CO2, it binds proton, a major buffering system in our blood. Mutations lead to sickle cell chain imbalance to the thalassemias. There's unstable hemoglobin variants. There's high affinity hemoglobin variants. There's all the transcriptional diseases. There's the sickle mutations. It, you know, the list goes on and on. So this is something you're intimately aware of. What you may not under uh, know about is how susceptible it is to oxidation. Of course, it, like all iron molecules, it can rust. So your red cell is just filled with antioxidant machinery to keep that iron in the two plus reduced state. And that's why G6PD deficiency and other things can lead to met hemoglobinemia and hemolysis. Mm -hmm. So a big system keeps this thing reduced, but it's also incredibly reactive with nitric oxide. And there's two major reactions I'm gonna talk about today. Nitric oxide reacts with oxygenated hemoglobin at that heme site to oxidize that heme to met hemoglobin. And that reaction destroys nitric oxide. And there's another reaction of nitrite that can react with the deoxygenated heme and the, an electron proton transfer reaction can make nitric oxide. So it's sort of the yin and yang. This molecule can destroy NO and make NO. And I'll share that story with you. So the historic ability of hemoglobin to inhibit or destroy nitric oxide actually was key to the discovery that the endothelium derived relaxing factor was nitric oxide. And very early, Ignaro, Murad, Furchgott, who all won the Nobel Prize, they, they observed that hemoglobin would inhibit the endothelium derived relaxing factor, this thing produced by endothelium that dilated. And this reaction was known about since 1850. So it was well known that, that, that NO was scavenged by hemoglobin. So people put two and two together that something that was inhibited by hemoglobin could be nitric oxide. And these were the types of historic experiments. You could take an aortic ring and you could add serotonin and constrict it. And then you relax it with acetylcholine. Remember, acetylcholine stimulates NO synthase to release NO. At the time they didn't know it was NO, they just thought it was endothelin derived relaxing factor. But if you could add just a trace amount of hemoglobin, one micromolar hemoglobin, you completely inhibit the dilation. But this also creates a paradox in the field. How can nitric oxide be the endothelium derived relaxing factor? How can it dilate 25% or control 25% of your blood flow? When you don't have one micromolar hemoglobin in your blood, you have 10 millimolar hemoglobin in your blood. In your cardiomyocyte, you have 200 micromolar myoglobin. How can ENOS function in a cardiomyocyte? And that has remained a mystery for, 10, for the last 20 years. And so how can NO signal in cells and bloodstream in the presence of so much hemoglobin or in cardiomyocytes or skeletal muscle and so much myoglobin? There's also superoxide everywhere, which also reacts with nitric oxide at a near diffusion limited rate. And in fact, when you do kinetic modeling, computational modeling, NO cannot signal in a cardiomyocyte. It cannot signal in blood and it cannot signal in skeletal muscle. 
So I entered the field a little late after the Nobel Prizes were awarded and was really focused among other investigators on this central mystery. And what's been discovered by our group and other groups is if you look at the middle, part of the reason this happens in blood is because evolution placed hemoglobin inside the red cell. And it turns out this creates major diffusional barriers around the endothelium where NO is produced. When red cells flow in laminar flow, by Bernoulli's effect, they move to the middle. That creates a cell-free zone. The glycocalyx pushes the red cells away, creating a greater diffusion barrier. There's also these biophysical diffusion barriers around the red cell, and there's a submembrane skeleton that creates a distance. And remember, since nitric oxide is freely diffusible, it really, the farther away the red cell is, the more you create a zone, a concentration zone around the endothelium. But what this results in is when you hemolyze, it only takes a tiny amount of hemoglobin, that one micromolar, to completely destroy that NO and disrupt those diffusion barriers. And it turns out the hemoglobin can actually extravasate between endothelium cells, between endothelial and smooth muscle. So chronic hemolysis leads to vascular injury and vasculopathy, things like pulmonary hypertension and sickle cell disease. And the last piece, which has been very controversial and very interesting, is that there may also be endocrine NO signaling, that some of this NO can be converted, for example, to nitrite and reactivated to dilate. And I'd like to share that story with you. So the first lesson I'd share with all of you is ask important questions. And an important question is something that if it's positive or negative, it's still interesting. And about two years into my fellowship, I was focusing on P11, phospholipase A2, airway epithelial cells, and I became interested in a side question. And as a critical care doctor, that is, is there endocrine delivery of NO? And if you've given anybody inhaled nitric oxide, it's probably on your boards, it doesn't drop blood pressure. And the reason is you breathe it, it's a selective pulmonary vasodilator. If any of that NO leaks into your bloodstream, it is inactivated by reacting with hemoglobin in the red cell. So even though there's those diffusion barriers, those diffusion barriers reduce the reaction of NO with hemoglobin in a red cell by about a thousand fold. So one of every 1000 red cells can hemolyze to have the full scavenging effect of blood. But the problem is that rate of reaction is still so fast that NO only has a half-life in our blood of less than 0.2 milliseconds. So there's no way if you breathe NO, there's no way authentic NO could get to your arm or your body. But there was some subtle data that suggest it was getting there. And I was interested in that observation. And this was a study by Paul Cubes published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And he later discovered netosis, DNA nets. Uh, I, I know Dr. Lee's worked on that a lot. But he took cats and he, and he was studying ischemia reperfusion in their intestine. And he'd shown earlier that if the, the cat had ischemia reperfusion in the intestine, blood flow dropped. And he'd shown that was nitric oxide dependent. So he here, he infuses an inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase called L-name. L-name is an arginine analog that blocks the arginine binding site. And when he does that in the cat, look at this, cat blood flow drops. And that's shown by a, a negative, a drop in the diameter, a constriction. But if he gave inhaled NO, it prevented that constriction. Somehow inhaled NO was getting out to the periphery and restoring the NO signaling. So I started with the very simple question, would inhaled NO do the same thing in people? And I was thinking we could use that as a therapy for stroke or heart attack, something like that. And so I had to answer that question. And my lesson number two is whenever you're doing a translational question or doing science, whether it's clinical science or basic science, go more fundamental. Um, if you're doing clinical research, learn R, Python, big data analytics, AI. If you're in the basic sciences, learn basic science methods. And for me, the tools in translation would be analytical chemistry, mass spec, flow cytometry, molecular biology, and bedside tools that are fundamental, how to write an IRB, how to get an IND with the FDA, how to image. Um, and I partnered at this time with another mentor. I, I, I grabbed a new mentor, Richard Cannon, an NHLBI, who was an expert in measuring foreign blood flow with strain gauge plethysmography. 
and I became obsessed at that point in my career. And I had protected time with analytical chemistry and, and using mass spec to develop standards. And so as you'll hear, I, 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 through trial and error, took kind of a risk in my career and learned how to measure very low levels of NO modified species in blood and, and oxidation products of nitric oxide reactions in blood. And I learned to do blood flow even though as a pulmonary fellow, and it, that was easy for me because I could put A-lines in and I could bring patients to the ICU for these studies. So we reproduced the Paul Cubes experiment in cats in humans. And what we did is we put a catheter in the brachial artery and we would infuse LNMMA, which was an approved, it was it's not approved, but we could get an IND for it. It was like L-name, but you could use it in humans and it would block NO production in the arm. And then we'd have people exercise to create some exercise stress. And then we'd repeat that during inhaled NO, looking for a very subtle effect on blood flow during NO synthase inhibition, just like Paul Cubes did. And look what we found. This is almost the same as that cat experiment. Here I'm showing forearm blood flow. And these were young, healthy people like our resident sitting over there. So if I gave you LNMA, you'd get hypertensive. And if I infused it into your forearm, your blood flow drops 25%. It's amazing. If you smoke for one week, if you have hypercholesterolemia, if you have obesity, if you're sorry, if you're a man over 55, that you have the same phenomenon that your NO uh, production drops. But when I gave inhaled NO, there was an abrogation. Somehow NO was restoring flow. And this was the first example that there was an endocrine NO signal. So the other lesson, and I heard this great lecture yesterday from your fellow on the cholesterol metabolism in, in uh, uh, tuberculosis, where he just did a metabol metabolomic screen. What's his name again? Andrew? Yeah. And uh, he followed the data to an incredible discovery. Uh, oftentimes, we don't have a great hypothesis. We're just following the data. And early in my career, I just made sure the data was right, and then followed the data, maybe taking some risk and hypotheses to explain the data. Um, and I was focused on what is that species? What's accounting for that endocrine effect? And I knew it couldn't be NO. All my chemistry friends told me that reaction's too fast. It can't be NO itself. And so I had spent months learning how to measure very low levels of s nitroso hemoglobin, which is NO bound to the cysteine of hemoglobin, s nitroso albumin. And for, for just bookkeeping, I always measured nitrate and nitrite. So in this study, what I'm showing is the artery minus the vein level of the species times blood flow using the Fick equation. That's the consumption from artery to vein. And despite at the time, everyone thought this kind of phenomenon was going to be caused by a nitroso thiol, snow hemoglobin or snow albumin, we saw no consumption under any of these conditions of snow hemoglobin, no consumption of snow albumin. But interestingly, despite the fact that nitrite was supposed to be an inert oxidation product of NO, it always had an AB gradient and the consumption was sustained during NOS inhibition and, and increased during exercise, like oxygen. So at that point, I asked the very controversial question and we published that and suggested that what if nitrite is actually an endocrine species of NO metabolism. And when you breathe NO, the only thing that went up significantly every time was nitrite. So the next question is, is this an intrinsic vasodilator? And this was very controversial at the time, and it was a scary period for my career because I was a, essentially a postdoctoral uh, pulmonary fellow um, and uh, people couldn't believe this was true. So we set up this experiment. We did the same kind of setup except in this case, I got nitrite from the cyanide antidote kit and wrote an IND to the FDA to infuse it in the forearm. And we repeated it. Now we hypothesized we were only gonna see dilation during enosynthase inhibition and exercise. It was gonna be a very subtle effect. And we infused 200 micromolar of this final concentration in the arm. And as soon as I infused it, the palms turned red and blood flow went up 200% in the arm which at the time was shocking. So we, I thought I had a problem. We, we buffered the solution. We dropped the nitrite to the near physiologic level. And as you'll see, uh, it dilated 10 out of 10 patients. It dilated at rest during NO synthase inhibition with exercise. 
And we saw this dilation even during exercise at the near physiologic level of nitrite. And that was immensely controversial for about two years and everybody started infusing nitrite into people and rabbits and rats and mice. And it's now accepted that there's this new paradigm for NO signaling that you have an arginine oxidation to NO pathway that's very complex, but you also have a very primitive pathway. And this is the reductive pathway of nitrite to NO. Now this is hypoxic potentiated. It's interesting, it's very primitive and conserved. Bacteria have nitrite reductase, they're proton electron transfer reactions to convert nitrite to NO that are oxygen independent. And another investigator, Lundberg, had discovered that bacteria in our mouth have nitrate reductases. We've lost in, in evolution nitrate reductases, but we, we have a symbiosis with our oral microbiome and the nitrate reductases in the mouth will convert nitrate to nitrite. And then as I'll show you, nitrite would go to NO. Um, and this is sort of this, this enterosalivary circuit. This is kind of hot now in the exercise, like all these people drink beetroot juice and stuff. Not sure it works, but if you drink nitrite, it goes in the stomach. And if you give patients a nitrate, a nitrate, this is NO3 minus, you see for about 24 hours, nitrate will rise in the blood. These are healthy volunteers by Amrita Aluwalia uh, giving a nitrate. Some of that nitrate interestingly goes out in the urine. But what's interesting is our bodies absorb some of that nitrate and we concentrate it in, in uh, our sal saliva. So we hold on to the nitrate and we recirculate it in our saliva. And the reason is, as you'll hear, there's these bacteria, as I said, that convert that nitrate to nitrite. You swallow that nitrite and Lundberg had shown that that generated NO in the stomach because of the acidity. Mm -hmm. But what we found later is some of that nitrite is then absorbed in the blood and you can see this slow increase in the nitrite levels in blood. And it's converted to NO via the pathways we, di we discovered. So you can see cyclic GMP levels go up in blood and dropping blood pressure. Well, this generated a lot of excitement because they also showed at the time that if you spit, you, you drank the nitrate, your blood level of nitrate goes up, and then you spit. You never swallowed your saliva. Um, you never increase the nitrite and your blood pressure doesn't drop. So it really requires the swallowing of the salivary uh, nitrite. And you can kill the bacteria. So, and this is probably the best example that this is physiologic. In this study, it was a placebo controlled crossover study. They gave normal volunteers chlorhexidine to kill the mouth microbiome. And when you do that, the sal salivary nitrite drops this was crossover, but they're showing the unblinded measurements. The urinary nitrite drops, the plasma nitrite drops, because now you don't have bacteria to convert the nitrate from your regular diet that you eat every day and leafy green vegetables, beetroots, whatever. So now you drop the nitrite and blood pressure goes up. And that change in nitrite correlates with the drop in blood pressure, suggesting that some of our blood pressure is regulated by eating nitrate in our diet and the oral microbiome converting that to nitrite. So how do we go more fundamental? What was the mechanism of how nitrite was dilating? And I had one observation that whenever I infused nitrite into the forearm, during that half circulatory time, if I measured the artery and venous level of NO modified hemoglobins, there was an increase in NO bound to hemoglobin. So nitrite infused in the artery, coming out of the vein, you have NO bound to hemoglobin. And we correlated under all the conditions, exercise, LNMA in, in, inhibition, this relationship that as oxygen saturation dropped, the amount of NO bound to the heme of hemoglobin increased. You know, when you exercise or you block NOS and blood flow, you, you're, you're, you extract more oxygen from the hemoglobin and we saw more NO bound to hemoglobin coming out of the antecubital vein. So there seemed to be a relationship between infusing nitrite, deoxygenation of hemoglobin and the formation of NO. And so we went to the literature and we discovered these two old papers. One paper from Doyle in 81 and actually a paper all the way back in 1937 by Brooks. And they described this reaction 
So this is the second chemical reaction I'm sharing with the nitrite, deoxyhemoglobin in a proton, oxidizes the hemoglobin to met and makes NO. And an NO could bind to another deoxyhemoglobin to make this NO heme, NO ferroheme that we were measuring. So this is a very simple reaction. This is actually an electron transfer reaction from the iron two of hemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin and nitrite, proton from water to make met and NO. There's a chance for that NO to escape the hemoglobin because NO doesn't bind very well to met hemoglobin. And then it bound to another hemoglobin to make NO hemoglobin, which we thought we were measuring as a dosimeter of this reaction. So in vivo from artery to vein, nitrites reacting with deoxyhemoglobin to make NO. Now we were struck that that reaction requires a proton. It requires deoxyhemoglobin. So that's an ideal oxygen sensor, metabolic sensor, anogenerating reaction. And we hypothesized that these hypoxia nitrite and hemoglobin and red cells could drive hypoxic dilation. Um, and while I won't go into too much detail, I'll just share with you that this ended up being a fascinating reaction because of course hemoglobin is not just the deoxyheme, it's an allosteric molecule. It goes from the oxy R state to the deoxy T state. And it turned out this reaction was allosterically regulated. And the reason it was is under oxygenated condition when hemoglobin is in the R state, its reactivity, its rate constant is very high. But when it deoxygenates to the T state, its rate constant is low because it's really two molecules. So it turns out the reaction is faster with nitrite under oxy conditions, but nitrite can only bind to the deoxyhemoglobin. So this reaction generates the most NO right at that R to T transition around the P50. And this is day, actual data showing the rate of nitrite reduction formation of NO with hemoglobin peaks around 50% hemoglobin oxygen saturation, which would be ideal as a hypoxic sensor NO generating reaction. So we've done lots of studies, um, and this is work with Kara Hewen, who's an endocrine, who has had a K with me. We, we, we were able to get 15 heavy isotope labeled nitrite, and we have people uh, uh, drink it, or take the pills and you see drops in blood pressure. We see inhibition of platelet activity. That's a canonical NO signaling pathway. And by EPR, electron paranoid resonance, we could actually measure the formation of NO heme in the blood that correlated with that drop in pressure and inhibition, suggesting that this reaction is occurring in vivo and regulating NO signaling. And another lesson is just the importance of collaborative networks. You know, I was a physician learning chemistry. And I could never have done this work without these friendships. And often you'll develop friendships with peer mentors. Um, you'll have your, your, your sage experience mentors, but you'll develop new peer mentors. And a lot of this work was a partnership with Danny Kim Shapiro. He's now the chair of biophysics at Wake Forest University. Um, but Neil Hoggs was the s nitrosethyl chemist. Dave Wink, he's, he's still at, uh, in the NCI. And Katrina Miranda were NO minus experts. Um, and Claudia Morris is the arginine queen. She's famous for arginine research. And we all would work together and come up with ideas. And we jokingly called ourselves the nitrite tie club after the famous mRNA tie club, a little grandiose. So how does NO escape the red cell? I told you about all that scavenging. Um, and I'll just say one thing is that it this has been very controversial, but it happens. Multiple studies have shown that if you expose nitrite to red cells, you can make NO gas and you can inhibit platelet activation. Um, NO-treated red cells can dilate. Erythrocytes and nitrite release NO gas from red cells and can inhibit cytochrome C-dependent respiration. There's now great data. We, we looked at ENOS knockout mice, and it turns out there is a functional red cell ENOS. And there's recently a great study out of um, Germany where they have cardio-specific ENOS knockouts that actually increase blood pressure um, right here. So we've studied over the last decade, multiple chemistries where nitrite either via one electron reduction or electron ox addition oxidation can generate via these reactions, things like NO, uh, uh, nitrogen dioxide and molecules like N2O3, which can diffuse in red cells. But lately we've been very interested in a new discovery. 
And that what if NO is binding to deoxyhemoglobin? And what if that NO heme is like a little flying saucer and then can ex export through heme transport enzymes? And over the last 15 years, hematologists like Dr. Abkowitz have discovered all these heme transport enzymes that move heme all the way around. We make billions of molecules of heme every minute and we're moving it all around our blood. What if this reaction would make little NO heme flying saucers? And in fact, Ignaro had shown with his discovery that NO was a signaling molecule that he could add NO heme to the SGC, which is the receptor for NO that was APO. It didn't have a heme on it. And that little cassette would bind and activate SGC. So what if the NO heme is actually a stable molecule that's shuttling around? And that's how NO could get from NOS to myoglobin to SGC. And while I won't go into much detail, we've just discovered this new reaction that we're very excited about, where NO can react with ferric heme in the presence of a thiol, and you immediately go to NO heme and formation of a thiol radical. And we're calling this reaction thiol catalyzed reductive nitrosylation. Um, this is in review right now. Um, and you can see it's a very fast reaction. And what's really exciting is we can take that NO ferroheme and it binds to albumin, it binds to hemopexin, it's soluble in membranes. But the NO ferroheme binds to albumin. There's multiple heme binding sites on albumin, as many of you know. And you can add that NO ferroheme to activated platelets and it inhibits platelets. And more importantly, we can infuse it. This is a mouse model where we've infused L name to knock out endogenous NO synthesis. And in the red, I'm showing the injection of this NO ferroheme albumin. And this is even at 7.5 nanomolar, we see potent vasodilation. And here we're showing NO gas controls. We're showing GSNO controls. It's a very potent immediate reaction, suggesting that the NO ferroheme albumin is either going through the endothelium through transcytosis, albumin does that, or the NO heme is being handed off to a heme transporter. And those are things we're working on. So if you make NO in a red cell from the reaction with deoxyhemoglobin, from red cell ENOS, um, you're going to make some NO heme. And if it, you just made NO, it would be scavenged by oxidation by hemoglobin, as I showed you. It could bind NO heme to be scavenged. It could react with superoxide. Kinetically, there should be no way it can get to SGC. So our hypothesis that the formation of these NO hemes via transfer through heme transporters, albumin could deliver NO to SGC. And that's the thing we're investigating right now. So what I've shown you is that hemoglobin actually should be considered an oxidoreductase enzyme. In fact, most iron two molecules have oxidoreductase activity that can oxidize NO under normoxia and generate NO under hypoxia. And that's just showing those two reactions that I showed you that are very important in biology. So the great thing about a life in science, clinical science, basic science, is you just keep finding cool things. That NO heme reaction, we, we were just randomly adding, we were trying to look at the flying saucer idea and we had added NO to, to he, hemin, iron three. And when we added thiol, that reaction happened and we were sort of, Completely surprised by that. And everybody in the NO field, or my team presented at the Gordon Conference, everybody in the NO field is like, what? You know, we thought this field was dying. You know, where did this NO heme thing come from? Um, but one fun thing I've been interested in is what are the function of all these hemoglobins in our body? So hemoglobin is one of the most conserved proteins, but you may not know there's hemoglobin. You know about myoglobin and muscle and heart, but it turns out there's another molecule called cytoglobin, which is discovered when we start sequencing genomes. And there's something called neuroglobin. There's just been the discovery this year of something called androglobin because it's in sperm. And uh, there's something called globin X. There's all these globins. And cytoglobin is really interesting because it's in all of our cells. Nobody knows what it does. Now, Jay Zwier has shown that it has nitrite reductase activities like hemoglobin. It has NO scavenging activities, the oxidase activity that I showed you about. There's been lots of papers on that. But then we were introduced to CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And Paola Corti is a zebrafish person in my lab. And this is the great thing about science too. And she came to me, her mentor moved. She said, would you mentor me in vascular biology? And I said, I don't know anything about zebrafish. 
And I said, and she was an expert in molecular biology, microscopy, and zebrafish. And I said to her, well, uh, this CRISPR-Cas9 thing's cool. Why don't you knock out all the globins and let's see what happens? And the cool thing about zebrafish, as you all know, is they're see-through. That's why people love them. You can genetically manipulate a mice, but you can look through them because they're see-through. So you can look at development. And this is just showing kind of blood flow moving through and things like that. So she created CRISPR-Cas9 constructs. As you know, Cas9, people, I probably shouldn't use a gun analogy, but it's like the RNA where you have an RNA that binds the Cas9 and an RNA that will bind to very specific targets. And then the Cas9 is like the active gun that has a, a, a endonuclease. So when it binds to the right sequence, it cuts it. So it's very effective at cutting DNA in specific spots. So we were able to cut and knock out cytoglobin very quickly. And these were two constructs we developed. And when we looked at it, something very unexpected was observed. And that is normally, here we're looking at the underside of, of uh, an embryo, a fish embryo, and the atria is over here, and it goes from the zebrafish left to the right, the blood flow, atria to ventricle, atria, you know, fish have two chambered hearts. But in our, and normally, we always keep everything on the right side, right? Our heart's on the left, our liver's on the right. But what we found is about half of the time in these zebrafish, it was random. And we would see a right-sided heart. Can everybody see that? And when we calculated, I mean, this is 283 embryos, 422 embryos, painstaking microscopy. She and Liz Ronchon showed that this, this light blue is the normal left side and it's sustained in the wild type. But in the knockout, it was random. Only about half the time was there a left side heart. And of course, you all know about this disease. Over here is a patient who has the heart on the right side instead of left, dextrocardia. They have severe sinusitis. They have chronic bronchiectasis. And here is um, uh, situs inversus totalis, where the liver and spleen are, and stomach are all on the wrong side as well. And this is, of course, a primary ciliary dyskinesia where the cilia don't work, Cartagener syndrome. This is an inherited disease. There's more than 50 genetic variants, almost all of them in cilia. Um, chronic sinusitis, bronchitis, bronchiectasis, recurrent pneumonia, infertility. And um, most of these disrupt cilia. And a central and still mysterious observation is people with primary ciliary dyskinesias have almost zero exhaled NO. So I was sort of struck that this is a syndrome that's a cilia problem, low NO, and we had observed it by knocking out cytoglobin. So we thought, well, what if cytoglobin has something to do with cilia? And interestingly, in the last year, people discovered androglobin, and androglobin is associated with the, the modal flagella cilia of sperm. So there's been a link in the literature to a globin and cilia. And um, indeed, we, we now, so then we looked at this thing called the KV. Now, I didn't know anything about this, but in development, we have this right left organizer. It's a little epithelial lined organelle in development that has cilia and it makes the fluid go in a circle. And when that fluid goes in a circle, um, it sends signaling molecules to one side or the other and it tells the, the developing embryo what's right and what's left. So they call it the left-right organizer, the Cooper vesicle, the laterality organizer, um, a variety of things. But we looked at the cilia in it, and indeed the cilia were short and not very functional. And we found there was cytoglobin in the cilia and it co-localized both RNA and protein within the right-left organizer. And this is the really cool experiments. You can inject microbeads into the KV vessel and you can track the movement of the fluid. And so in a wild type embryo, you can see this normal circular movement of these beads summarized here for multiple experiments. If we block NO, those beads slow down. That's an inhibitor of NO, PTIO. And in our cytoglobin knockout, look, there was almost no cilia motion in the KV. And if we gave an NO donor called Detano, we could restore it a little bit. 
And that's shown the inhibition with PTIO, this, the extreme reduction with cytoglobin knockout, and the restoration, partial restoration with NO. And we could improve, you can see this normal, um, you can see the lack of laterality with the cytoglobin 2 knockout that we could recover with an NO donor. So somehow cytoglobin seemed to be increasing NO. And interestingly, if we knock down cytoglobin, the cilia length is reduced. If we knock down the, the receptor for NO, guanylate cyclase, the cilia is reduced. And if we knock down the primitive NOS of zebrafish, NOS2B, the cilia are, are impaired. And the same thing goes for the laterality defect. So what we've learned is that cytoglobin appears to be activating NOS. Now, I told you cytoglobin can scavenge NO. It can generate NO from nitrite. But this is now a third and unexpected finding that a globin can somehow activate an NO synthase to make NO activate SGC and affect cilia function. And we're now studying that mechanism of how it's activating NOS, um, but another surprise about globin function. And just to show you, these are airway epithelial cells from the human at atlas by, uh, um, by single cell RNA, and they're loaded with cytoglobin. And we've been looking at the cytoglobin knockout mouse where you see a very similar effect. So just the last second, I'll just, I'll just have to jump through this. But the other important thing is we're all on our phones. We're all working hard. We don't give us a minute to think. And it's important in life to take time to think. And every summer I go out to Oregon with my family and I go for runs. And uh, one summer, these are the boys, clothing's optional out there. And they're, they're older now. They, they wouldn't like me to show you this. But one summer, Joe Beckman came, who's from the Linus Pauling Institute. And he asked me, is there an antidote for CO poisoning? He actually discovered peroxynitrite, another NO molecule. And I said, no, I do critical care. There's no antidote for carbon monoxide poisoning. And so I started running and I started thinking every day out there, I had time and I'd think, you know, I, he told me, he said, you've studied NO reactions with hemoglobin and NO binding to hemoglobin. You should be able to figure out how to get a CO off of hemoglobin. He told me that. And I thought, huh, I bet I could. You know, so I started thinking about oxidizing it with ferrous cyanide and but then it hit me, and I'll just jump. You, you guys know about CO poisoning, but um, just to jump over, we had this molecule neuroglobin, and we had mutated it to try to make a, a hemoglobin oxygen carrier. We'd converted this histidine into, to a glutamine. But when we did it, we were surprised it bound CO and oxygen with very high affinity, super high affinity. In fact, the affinity of this mutant neuroglobin for CO was 300 times higher than hemoglobin. So I thought, could we infuse it and would it just suck up the CO? So these are 100% CO saturated red cells. We incubate the neuroglobin outside of the red cells and monitor the transfer. And as you can see here, there's an immediate transfer CO from 100% CO saturated to zero, all going to the neuroglobin within a minute. And the normal half-life of a CO red cell sitting in a jar is 500 minutes. Our half-life went to 25 seconds. And we could poison mice with CO, and they you and, and after the poisoning, we we infuse our antidote. This is infusing albumin or saline, and the blood pressure goes away and they die. But we could restore the blood pressure, and we could improve survival in mice. And you can this is the CO clearance, CO levels dropping with the infusion, blood lactate not going up as much, and. Uh, We've described this as a ligand trap for CO. And uh, this smart guy just entered my lab. He just got his KR00. He's going to take a faculty job at Wayne State. But he got interested in this bacteria that makes a CO sensing transcription factor, RCOM. And so we've cleaved that. And it's a really interesting molecule because it's very shielded and protected, but binds to CO with very high affinity. And I'll just share with you that it has one of the best CO affinity to oxygen affinity is known because it binds CO with high affinity, but it has a lower oxygen affinity than even our neuroglobin molecule. And he uh, has a paper that's in review now showing that it's an excellent CO antidote. It scavenges CO, and then the molecule just comes out in the urine, almost fully CO saturated. So I'll just conclude that you all know about hemoglobin as driving oxygen gradients that hemoglobin helps um, transfer oxygen from normoxy to hypoxia. 
what I've shared with you, but it also controls NO gradients by having reductase activities and maybe even NOS activation, a surprise with our cytoglobin finding under hypoxia, but oxidizing NO under normoxia. And of course, it could drive CO gradients, which is something we're looking at therapeutically. And lastly, always surround yourself with smarter people. You know, I, I wasn't a chemist or a biophysicist or a, a, a CRISPR molecular biologist, but by partnering with really smart people, you can have a big effect and continue to have a rich, continually evolving career of discovery. So I'll stop there and I apologize for being a little long, Dr. Frazier. Thanks. Mark, thanks so much for that great talk. Tremendous evolution of following the science. Uh, we have time, I think, for a couple questions. Morali? Uh, quick question. Uh, the story about the salivary, uh, the role of salivary glands converting the lactate to alcohol. I'm just curious, what genes are you studying that you have patients with various genetic issues which you have compared to salivary production? Is this just one of the reasons why they're so susceptible to developing pulmonary lactate resistance or they don't have that in time? Yeah, it's a great question. There have been, oh, yeah, the question is whether people with sal inflammatory salivary conditions, you know, uh, patients with Sjogren's, for example, um, where they get epithelial inflammation and they lose their salivary function, whether that um, could then lead to impairment of this microbiome nitrate to nitrite pathway. It's a great question. Um, people have looked at, you know, in, in the Karolinska group has looked at tube feeding patients showing that they have lower nitrite levels. People have looked at a lot of, people have been looking at the microbiome and the impact of, of, of changes in microbiome on the nitrate reductase activity, like Allison Morris has been looking at that. Um, and there's been a lot of studies on this microbiome. Nobody has ever looked at the Sika syndrome and whether that uh, could affect that, but it's a great question. Oh, really? He probably is reviewing our paper. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Steve, yeah. Yeah, I should have, Steve's actually shared some cells with us. So he's shared some cells with us. Um, and so, yes, thank you. If you're on the line, thank you, Dr. Brody. But, you know, nobody would have thought that a globin would be associated. People knew that NOS could regulate cilia motility. And there's data that high NO and low NO can have opposing effects on cilia function. So there was a link between NO signaling and cilia activity. But again, we're still trying to figure out, is it, um, you know, because we all we see a few things. We see dysmorphic cilia, but we also see impaired cilia beating. So we're sort of, that's sort of where we're focused now. And, and, and also in the basic lab, trying to figure out the NOS. We're doing a lot of recombinant NOS work with recombinant cytoglobin on why it would activate NOS. And we don't know that. Yeah, so, so, you know, in the interesting thing in zebrafish, NOS2b is a very primitive NOS, and it has a lot of sequence homology with our INOS, but also some with ENOS. And airway epithelium in humans is almost all and in mice INOS. There is some NNOS, but um, so the exhaled NO in asthma and in your nasal pharynx, that's all INOS in airway epithelial cells. It's not really coming from your blood enos. It's actually coming from the airway epithelium, which in the human body, the airway epithelium makes the most NO per cell in the form of, of steady expression of inos. And if you give a cytokine mix, you'll get enormous upregulation of inos. 
And so the weird thing about the ciliopathy is they have no NO. So it's a bit of a chicken or egg, you know, our finding does, you know, our hypothesis would be that cytoglobin is modulating NO and the NO is modulating the cilia. But in ciliopathies, you also get low NO. So it's a little bit of a, you know, we're puzzling through this. Um, I think what we have for sure that's really exciting is nobody's ever shown that a hemoglobin activates a NOS and nobody's ever shown that a globin regulates cilia. And we see very dramatic modulation of cilia development, the role of cilia in development with um, the whole pathway from NOS to B to SGC. We've now knocked out SGC with um, CRISPR and you get a profound um, uh, laterality defect. It's even stronger. The cytoglobin effect's pretty strong as you saw, but it's really strong when you take out SGC. So it really does appear to be NO, you know, NOS, NO, SGC, cyclic GMP dependent. All right, thank you very much. All right, thanks.